patriarchy that is blocking and stopping women from accessing um, these fields and these roles. So it's a, it's a mixture of things. You can't pinpoint one single thing that is not allowing us as African women to participate. Um, but it all stems from um, a lack of gender equity in, in our societies and in our communities that goes from the very um, little nuclear bubbles, hubs of the family to our communities that then extend to the bigger, larger spaces and infrastructures that are politics and our political spaces. Yeah, you're right about that. It's actually an intersectional challenge, like there are numerous dimensions to it. So Wakana, would you please uh, wait on that? Thank you. Now I, th I think you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and um, the question was, what is this possible for the low level of women? Uh, I think there are several factors that influence uh, the low level of women participation in politics. On the one hand, there are structural epidemic caused by discriminatory culture, example in Burundi, and uh, laws and institutions that still today reduce their possibilities of voting or running for political office. And on the other hand, there is the other element, which is like at the so that means women are less likely than men uh, to the undergo training, access <laughs> information on their, on their rights, to establish contact and uh, to benefit from the first techniques, their rights and the resources that needed to become successful leaders. That is my point. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Wakana. Sophia? I'd like to hear your opinion on the question. Thank you um, again for having me. I, I just feel very powerful right now. Just being on a panel with like amazing African women that I personally am a fan of. So this this is pretty cool. Um, and I do want to reiterate the point you made in how um, African women are not just um, in politics enough um, because sometimes people can like to say, oh, we're making progress, but at the same time, it's still very, very slow progress. And one of the key arguments that people always try to make is that oh, people, uh, women are working their way from the bottom to the top. So they're women in um, their female counselors, like a lot of female counselors, but that is still not the fact um, because when you look through all of Sub-Saharan Africa, there's only 20% female counselors in all 19 Sub-Saharan African countries. So yes, first point is that there is a lot of work that needs to be done and we need to stop assuming um, that we're making significant progress because we are making very, very slow progress and it needs to be fast-tracked. And a key way, um, the key reason that I think that this continues to persist is that as much as there are no women in politics, the funny aspect for me is that women run politics in Africa. I recently started following um, somebody online who's, who's running for political office. And this person, I'll tell you what this person's strategy has been. Uh, this person, they have spoken to all the women in the constituent that they're running, right? The market women, the yellow days, the mothers, that because they know that this is what gets you to win elections in Africa. This is how you win, by bringing the women together and garnering their support. So why are these women not aware of the power that they hold, the power that they yield when it comes to winning elections in Africa? And I think that a way for us to ensure that there are more women in political office is by going to these women and ensuring that they know and they understand the power that they hold when it comes to winning elections, because that's what the men do. They know that these, these are the people essentially who would gather and make people come out to vote for them, who would encourage the kids, who would force their friends. They go to the markets together, they're a community of women, right? They would always listen to the other person, oh, this is our candidate, this is who we're going for. And the men know, and they play on this so excellently. They bribe them with, you know, everything that the women want to hear. Oh, we're going to fix the marketplace, or we're going to give you food, we're going to give you money, and all that stuff. And I think that it is really time 
for us to recognize the power that these women hold. And it is time for us to let them know the power that they hold. Like that's the only way that they're gonna take that initiative to say, yes, we also want to belong in political office because to be honest, we run politics. But as it is, women do not see that power, especially the women in these communities, right? They still continue to see themselves as second class citizens. They're not aware that elections literally depend on them. And it really is up to us, people who know, um, to make sure that we are actively educating and informing these women that you wield the power to win elections in Africa and it is time to put someone who looks like you at the table. Thank you. You're right, Sophia, and those are very, very valid points because a lot of the time, we tend to notice that women are rallied just to come for elections and vote and then to get people to vote. By the end of the day, when a woman wants to run, there's a motive, maybe she just wants to make money and things like that. But those were very, very valid points. Wadi, could you please say something on that? I'm not sure there's any other thing to say because my colleagues have said it all, but I think I'll just add a few things. Um, so I'll give an example of the concept of hidden curriculum. I actually just knew about it because of my master's program, how in schooling, hidden curriculum is something you don't necessarily see. It's not visible yet, it's so powerful. And then I can see it play out in terms of how a typical or an average African family is from growing up, you're thought that you are a second, you know, the second citizen, you know, and maybe your brother or whoever the male figure is, is better than you or higher than you. You go to the school and they say you cannot be class captain, your assistant. You go to, you know, secondary school and it keeps going on and on and on. So these things, you know, they stick to us, you know, unconsciously. And it takes a lot of deliberate efforts for you to unlearn these things. So from your birth, you've been taught that, you know, you should not lead. You've seen all around you in every single um, institution, religious institutions, schooling, and every institution, you see that men are the ones that usually occupy. So by default, you just feel, you know, your place is second. And so that's why many times it takes a lot of you know, like I said, the deliberate efforts to unlearn that, you know, that you are not second in command. So that's the first thing that we actually forget the fact that, you know, over the years from birth till you're how old, you've always seen men lead. So you just somewhat just think that, oh, I shouldn't lead. Secondly, there are different forms of barriers. I would say structural barriers, for example, structural barriers, firstly, education. We know how Many times in Africa, they say before you can run, you need to you know, meet a lot of requirements, for which I think is hypocritical because we don't see many of these men meet the requirements. But then when it's a woman, you know, they're very, very strict or they'll bring one um, proof from how many years ago just to you know, make her not look good like the other men. So structural barriers like that, education and qualification. Secondly, financial. We know how expensive it is to run, you know, um, to campaign in Africa, you know, from um, lobbying people to buying the ticket and all of that. Many people don't have that financial strength and power to actually run. So these are forms of um, structural barriers that limit women. And sometimes I would say even personal, a lot of times as women, we tend to question ourselves or our abilities. There's this imposter syndrome that I'm not saying it doesn't exist for men, but I think it exists more for women because men generally would actually be more confident than what you know who they truly are i've gone gotten to places where you see how confident they are and you know they feel like they're the biggest deals that <laughs> ever happened and then you see them talk you're like well i can't believe this was the person making me feel so so we got scared so women usually we actually like to undervalue ourselves whatever we can do many times we try to and i'm guilty of that we try to actually you know, dim our light in quote. But on the, the flip side is the case for men. A lot of them go confidently. And then lastly, I would say cultural barriers where, like we said, for, starting from the home, but cultural barriers where many people, even the electorate, they don't believe that a woman should lead them. I've seen it happen severally, like in different communities. So even when she runs and you need people's votes, many of them, many men will say, oh, 
Why should a woman lead me? And some women as well, because of that mindset that they've grown up with, they also believe that a woman shouldn't lead. So these are some of the examples of barriers that I believe limit women from um, occupying space in politics in Africa. Thank you. All right, thanks for that, Wadi, and thanks to all our guests for their contributions on that particular question. I see someone has their hands up, or you can leave your questions in the comment box, and then we'll get to them eventually. So Wadi mentioned a lot of things. You talked about how women need to motivate themselves, and there's a need for women's empowerment in all these various spheres at churches, schools, and all of that. But then... A lot of the times there are several campaigns that have been done and we, it's a continuous process. Obviously, we keep educating women, we keep educating everyone in society to continue to see the value that women have to offer. So aside from the various methods of awareness and all of that, are there like concrete steps that can be taken by maybe members of political um, parties, the government, like what steps, what action steps can be taken to actually ensure that maybe there are resources for women and things like that. So um, Wakana, I think you should weigh in on that. Uh, thank you. And uh, first of all, I'm very sorry, there is no uh, electricity in my country, in my city at this time. That is why my video is uh, bad, so sorry. Uh, what more can be done to promote uh, women's participation in politics? I think that is the question, right? Uh, it's okay, Anna? Yes, yes, that's the question, yes. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, and uh, for my point is, uh, given that the participation of, uh, of women in politics is, uh, hampered by different barriers such, uh, such as culture, as I, I say in first question. And uh, I think that it is necessary to have women who wish to exercise a political mindset to develop strategies and skills according to the local challenges, linked to the discrimination, because each community in Africa has its own context. Uh, the other essential elements in this promotion is the creation of uh, voter education and the awareness program on the benefits of gender equality. And uh, uh, finally, uh, to support women's rights, the founders and leading organization that fight against culture and legal discrimination is essential to influence politicians, governments, in order to achieve uh, legal reforms, guarantees to women access to life. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, politics, I think also holding the politician accountable by taking responsibility for, for empowering women is uh, extremely uh, important as well, uh, because uh, I like to say this, uh, in the world, women are so many more than men. And uh, to empower them is to empower uh, a whole world. In this dimension, I think that uh, the mobilization of public opinion, a uh, truth initiative that encourage uh, the rural population, young people to defend the ideas that eliminate structural barriers against the emancipation of gender equality and encourage them to Medra in favor of gender equality today when uh, designing public policies is crucial. Thank you. Thanks for that, Wakana. You said that the, it's necessary for women's involvement to be prominent when all these policies are being made. And women's voices count, like you said. Women make up a large amount of the population. And without women, it's almost like if you're focused on, okay, just men running, that means you're neglecting a whole a lot of the population and that's not right. That's what we're clamoring for. That's why we always say, um, we always fight for equality and try to involve women in all these policies and in leadership roles. So the thing is in Africa, I think there, there's a lot of issues with equality as a whole. A lot of people tend to 
feel a type of way when issues of feminism are brought up or when equality is being spoken about, people will be like, oh yeah, I support equality, but then I'm not a feminist or feminism is just not the real deal and all of that. So I'd like to know, Vanessa, do you think people need to be more accepting of feminist ideologies? Do they, is there a way to make them understand that equality is part of like the basis of feminist movements? Vanessa? Yes, absolutely. I think the issue that people have a lot um, when it comes to when when I mention feminism in an African space and just use the term feminist and define my, myself as feminist, there's a very big stigma that comes with uh, with the word because there's a certain view of the feminist as a woman who does not respect men, uh, who doesn't want to get married, um, who's just career focused, who is just education focused and doesn't kind of fit the traditional view of the housewife that um, certain parts of our communities and our culture wants. And so all that stigma attached makes it very hard for us to pursue and carry uh, forward um, what comes with uh, with this word and what this word actually wants to do. In terms of gender equality, um, the barrier to it, as I mentioned, is just that I, I feel like there is, um, so I'm just trying to recollect my thought. Um, there is, there is a, a misunderstanding of what women participation in politics would mean. There is a misunderstanding of what um, more gender equity, more a feminist type of approach would mean. There is the idea that if we pursue a feminist approach, we are um, unappealing to men, we are blocking men out of the conversation. But when it comes to gender equality, when it comes to feminist approaches, it's about including everyone and making spaces for everyone. So when advocating for women to have more access to politics, when advocating for women to have more access to educational institutions when advocating for women to not just have a seat at the table but to be listened to. Um, we are also advocating um, on the other hand for men to be able to express some parts of, of themselves and um, just be able to um, be fully humans. Because one thing that comes with patriarchy and toxic masculinity is we stifle women. We tell women that we have to be submissive, that we have to adhere to a certain stereotype, to a certain way of being viewed. But at the same time, we also do in that same uh, thought of thinking as men as very cold, as very um, straightforward, as very logical, as people without emotions. Um, describing men sometimes in very savage words, we're doing a disservice to both of us, right? Not just to women, but to both men and women. And so in terms of um, a more feminist approach and the African community accepting feminism, I think is switching our narrative from we are a feminist because we want gender equality, because we want to create a space for every single aspect of society. In this moment, the focus is on women because we are the ones being stifled, because we are the ones not being given a voice. We are the ones whose voices are being shut. However, as we are advocating for all of this, we are also advocating for an equal space for all of us. It's not called gender equity for a reason, right? It's not called women's, you know, just women's space. It's called gender equity. Um, a way where all genders can express themselves and, um, and just be in a space and live. And I think all my other panelists mentioned it brilliantly from Monaka to Wadi to um, Sophia saying um, how the inclusion of women would allow us to create more comprehensive policies, would allow us to create policies that um, fill in all the loopholes of society, um, having women have a seat at the table, not just to fill, I think it was Wakana who was mentioning it, um, the quotas and tokenism. So just giving numbers to women and being like, okay, we're gonna have 30 women in parliament because we need to fill numbers, but not equipping women with the tools that they need, not helping women strip themselves of um, what I think was Sophia and Wadi that mentioned it brilliantly, this idea of uh, this imposter syndrome that we have, this idea of uh, how we can't lead as women, because that's how we've been brought up, right? And I think it was Wadi who was um, highlighting how throughout our entire lives, from your family at home to your school, to your workplace, all you see is men lead. And when women don't lead is because we are too emotional, is because we are too soft. And for someone who works in security, um, disarmament, um, in, and in, in um, foreign policy, 
we see that a lot of times. We see how um, as a woman and as a black African woman as well, when you enter into a room, the idea is, oh no, she's too soft. And then add young on top of it, even worse. She's too naive. She's too emotional. She doesn't understand. We need men to make the serious decisions. We need men to control nuclear weapons. Not to say much, but we've seen how the world is going with our women having spaces. We are seeing and we are leaving the consequences of um, not giving access to women in these spaces. And when you look at foreign policy, for instance, when you watch some of these um, UN meters or when you watch some of these international platforms uh, where men are giving speeches or there's a situation where there's a conversation going on, it's not women that are being emotional. Women answer questions in such a grace and such a dignity that sometimes I myself, I'm, I'm amazed. And that is one of the reasons even more why I love women, because there's so much grace in the way we take all the hurdles and still keep pushing. A lot of times it's men who lose it. And when it comes to nuclear weapons, um, which is my main focus, we are seeing it now. We saw it with Trump. We saw it um, with uh, the leader in North Korea. We are seeing it now with Putin, how we are wielding all these missiles, all these weapons as a way to portray power, right? Um, other than lean into to diplomacy. So that is that is what I would I would say. I hope I, I answered your question and I didn't stray away too much. Yes, thanks for that, Vanessa. You answered my question beautifully. And I think you're right. We need more women so that the power struggles in the world and all the in all the insecurities and all of that get to stop. So as much as we know that equality is like a whole something, it involves both men and women. And I'd like to know, this question goes to Sophia. What do you think we can do to involve more men to make them see that it's not just a women's thing and for them to actually play a role in joining women in lobbying for more women's participation in politics? First of all, I um, just absolutely, but I say you made such incredible points. Um, I feel like I'm just a personal fan of you right now um, because you did raise a lot of um, systemic. And I want to state that I believe that we working towards equality. It has to be everyone and everyone needs to play like an active role in this. Looking at the history of African women in politics, I'm not sure when or where we got it wrong because pre-colonial eras, we had very loud women who they raised cities, they, they did so much, you know, we just, when you hear examples, you have Amina, you have the Queen of Zaria and you were just like, so at what point did we as a people decide that women just cannot lead? Because all the examples of women leading in pre-colonial African history is literally women leading the country to victory, their status to prosperity. Like we're always on top of our game. So at what point in our history did we come to this realization that women are suddenly second-class citizens who are incapable of now leading their own people or leading their cities. And I'm not, I, I, I wanna say that it's it's like our culture, <laughs> but like that wasn't what our culture used to say. So was it colonialism, was it religion? What part um, introduced us to this idea that women are, are suddenly weak and then men just, you know, had to always um, have to always take take the upper hand. And I think that a way that we can begin to in, involve men is for them to begin to see things differently. I mean, take the gender bill, for instance, what's going on in Nigeria and the parliament literally saying they're not going to sign uh, the bill to allow more women into political space. And what is the reason? Literally, these men being like, this is not a part of our culture. It's literally not right for these amount of women to be in politics. Who made that law? I'd like to have a word with them. It's it's really important that we begin to have open conversations. And it's not easy. I see it online every single day. I see it on Twitter. Somebody tries to start up a conversation about equality and somebody is taking it the wrong way. Somebody is saying that, oh no, these women are just trying to 
take over the world. I mean, yes, we are, but like, <laughs> we're not trying to push you out. It's, it's really difficult because every time I really think about how can we evolve more men in this process, and I try to see how men are already being involved in this process. You literally want to have a conversation about feminism. You want to have a conversation about equality. And these men are already getting your pitchforks out to get you, right? And it's like, no, we don't do that over here. But we literally need to do that. We literally need to be able to speak. We need to be able to have open dialogues. Like Vanessa said, we need to lean towards diplomacy. It's the only way that we're going to move forward. Because right now it's just roadblocks. It's like this one doesn't want to agree for this one and this one doesn't want to agree for this one. So we're just going to keep hitting each other anyway. But somebody needs to calm down and listen. And that's the men, <laughs> not the women. But they need to understand that an equal space isn't about like women trying to claim everything for themselves, like Vanessa said. But everybody literally creating a better life for everyone and it's like look at the world everything is literally burning to the ground because we left the men to it i recently also have just been watching clips of the um black woman who is about to be in the supreme court in the u.s you can literally see who is who is calm and who is emotional it's the woman is definitely calm because these guys in the senate are literally going bonkers, asking all sorts of questions and losing their cool, but nobody is going to question whether they are capable for the job by them doing that. But I'm telling you one thing, if that woman had lost her, her calm for even one second, it would be the highlight. Every news, CNN, Fox, BBC, they're going to be talking about how she did this, she said that, she's not fit, she cannot be there. It's like the double standard is appalling. Right. Watching that interview, it's if a man, if if the woman literally responded or spoke in the tone that this scene, this men in the Senate were addressing her by, we would not have we would not be having the same conversation right now. We would literally be finding alternatives. All of the news would have literally been running all sorts of articles on how women can simply not hold political offices or high political offices because we just cannot keep our calm. I mean, it's not women who are bombing countries because they just want more land for themselves. No, but it is really time for these men to begin to understand that an equal space isn't a space for all women. It's a space for everyone. I really don't know how we can achieve that in Africa because every time we try, it literally always leads to something even worse. It's it's a headache. It's it's sad to watch how men are literally not interested in listening to the voices of women and, and hearing like our pleas and our plights and, and the things we go through. Um, but it is something that needs to happen, right? So if you're a man on this webinar, it's literally up to you to take, take the onus on yourself to understand that it is time for us to have more women in political spaces. It is time for us to start making equal decisions, right? Because we see, I, I don't need to speak too much about what the world literally looks like right now when we're living it all to the men. It is time for men to start understanding that nobody is a threat to anybody. We're all literally trying to make it up. We're not going to make it out to life, but we're trying to make a good life for every single person, right? And it's not just you, 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 and what you want. It is time for us to start understanding that women are capable Right. Just like my earlier points, we really run the elections in, in so many African countries. So it's not even a question of our capabilities now. It's a question of whether you are willing to listen and to allow. It would be impossible for just women to achieve equality on our own, because right now the men, they're holding the spaces so tightly and, and passing the button onto themselves. Right. And it's it's time for them to start allowing more women. Like we're not a threat. We're not gonna have menstrual cramps and, and ruin the Senate seatings. We're not gonna be so emotional in pregnancy and not make the right decisions. Like, come on. We see how New Zealand, New Zealand is literally my dream country. You see what it is like when a woman is president, is prime minister. Do you see how peaceful and everything in New Zealand just works? And that's literally what it's like when you have a woman 
who is empathetic. So many people like to raise this, like it's supposed to be a disadvantage, but it literally is an advantage, right? It, you cannot have a leader that's not empathetic. How do you want to relate to the sufferings of your people? And nobody does that better than women. Quote me anyway. I said what I said. Nobody's as empathetic as women. So it's, it's really about men this time, taking the onus on themselves to say, it is time for us to listen. It is time for us to have these open conversations. And it is time for us to let women into these spaces. We're going to take the spaces anyway, whether they like it or not, but it'd be so much easier if they just let us. <laughs> Back to you, Anna. Uh, thank you so much for that, Sophia. That was really heartfelt. And I actually saw someone in the comments also said it's time. We can't deny that it's time for women to lead. So yes, it's time. Um, before I bring in my colleague, Abimbola, to ask her own questions, I just really like, really like to let everyone know that you can leave your questions in the comment section and then we'll get to them. So Abimbola, the mic is with you now. Thank you, Hannah. And um, a giant thanks to all the guests. The session has been enlightening so far. And <clears throat> so my question, I think the first question goes to Vanessa. Um, earlier, you highlighted some of the biases against women. Um, for instance, there's this notion that, of course, that women are naive, um, too emotional. Um, some even um, consider that we are weaker vessels. And it's, it's reminded me of a conversation I had um, recently at work with one of my colleagues. And um, it, it, the conversation focused on women's participation in politics. And he noted that women are, that we, we, they are not, we are not ready to put in the work. Uh, we, we just want to see that we want the men to hand over this political power to us. And he also noted that when it comes to political campaigns, that our biological makeup may not be able to withstand the pressure of you know, uh, um, campaigns and the shenanigans that come with politics. So my question, and this, this particular conversation drew attention to the fact that um, um, Africa is predominantly patriarchal in nature. And of course, this, my colleague, is not the only one who holds the same, this same view. A lot of men, um, a lot of men, um, have um, this same view that, oh, women, they, they can't go out there, going to the, they can't, they, they don't have the power to withstand uh, moving to the grassroots and to, to campaign their um, political ideologies to people and all of that. So my question is, now patriarchy is one of the factors um, um, impeding the, the, the advocacy for equal rights. So the, the question is, do you think we can, consider that it is deeply rooted in Africa, in, in the African society, do you think we can tackle uh, patriarchy? And if yes, what are the things do you think we can do to actually uh, tackle this um, tenant or principles of um, patriarchy? Um, Vanessa, I think I would like you to answer the question. Thank you so much for, for that question, Abimbo. I think it's, it's a really young question. Um, and the conversation with that colleague of yours and um, him bringing in biology is something that um, leaves me kind of speechless because if, if we really want to leave it to biology, um, let's not talk about the strength of pregnant women. Women are literally creating human beings inside of them. But just leaving that aside and coming to your question about patriarchy, if you can dismantle it in the African society, the answer is yes, um, but it's very complex. It's not a yes or no um, type of type of question. There is a lot of work that needs to be done. There is a lot of um, barriers that need to be broken. And I think Sophia put it brilliantly when she said, the way forward is for men to listen. It's for men to give us the space, right? Because um, gender equity and breaking down these patriarchal structures is not just the work that women has to do. Also because we are not really the problem. Right. The reason why women don't have access to these institutions is because men don't want to, to allow us access. And the example that Safai made right now of this gender bill in Nigeria, it's because the politicians who are already in the room 
don't want other women gaining access to the rooms. The real issue here, the real problem here is not women. And I think the allusion to the fact that women are not ready to do the work, women are not willing to do the work, that is a very big false narrative. That is a very big PR machine um, that supporters of patriarchy are put together to justify the reason why they don't want to allow women access to these places. So as I said before, yes, we can break it down. Um, and there are various steps to do it. The first one being men willing to listen, um, or just supporters of patriarchy willing to, to listen. Because once again, women as a, as a group of society are not a monolith, right? Um, we are not all the same. We don't all think the same way. Um, so in talking about people who need to allow women access to these spaces, not just men, but also it might be even women who support these systems, these systems. and their supports might not even be conscious. It might be a conscious um, way of thinking due to the way they were brought up, due to the society and the community in which they live. And I think I saw someone in the comments um, alluding to that as well. And so way forward is people who support the patriarchy, the patriarchal system, listen to women like listen to us who do not support the system, who wants to break out of the system. The second step is to create a conducive environment for us to actually be effective, right? And creating that conducive environment goes from um, giving us the tools that we need and those tools can go from mentoring to help us get rid of all these imposter syndromes that we have, to help us strip ourselves of these insecurities that were imposed on us, to help us strip ourselves of all these labels. Women are too emotional. Women are not strong enough. Women um, are not powerful enough to lead. So systems to support us in breaking away from these barriers. Um, more structural systems as well, access to education. I think what did we mention? Access to finance as well to run these campaigns and um, to help women gain access to these spaces and thereby enable us to break these systems. So very um, theoretical things, but then that have to be put in practice. Another thing is once we give women access to these spaces, in this case, political spaces, is making sure that we are not just giving women a seat at the table, but we are actively listening to women. We are actively listening to whatever it is they have to say and putting it into practice. Because what we are seeing um, on the African scene right now is the numbers of women in parliament is increasing, right? We've seen Rwanda, very huge numbers. I think it's it's one of the most representative parliaments um, in the world. And in other um, African countries as well, we are seeing a number of women increasing. However, we are not seeing this influence in our politics, in our policies, in our legislations. And that is because women are there, but we are not being listened to. And also because a lot of times they like to give us um, the so-called soft um, ministries, um, right? So things that have to do um, with uh, kind of, you know, that doesn't have to do with things like security or like defense, but the so-called quote unquote um, soft ministries that they love to attach women to because we are soft, because we are I don't think that's the case. And in nuclear disarmament and in security and foreign policy, if we had more women, if we had a feminist approach to these kind of policies, we would not be where we are right now. And specifically to nuclear weapons and the threat of nuclear weapons right now, the first treaty that calls for the elimination of nuclear weapons, the treaty and the provision of nuclear weapons, was taken forward, was created and put into place thanks to a feminist policy thanks to feminist leaders, thanks to um, people who did not believe in toxic masculinity, who did not believe in this patriarchal system. And so this group of people brought about a treaty that calls for the elimination of nuclear weapons, which is something that we have never seen before in the history of mankind, especially when armed states such as the US, France, the UK, which not only are quite powerful states in themselves, but also have a very colonial approach um, to you know other other developing countries. So going back to breaking these patriarchal systems, giving women space, listening to us when we have to speak, and creating the infrastructures to support us when we do this. Because I don't think women are weak. Um, I don't think we are not putting in the work. I think we are doing amazing. Um, we have so much potential that needs to be explored. We just need to be given the space for it. Gender equity is not something that just women have to achieve and work on. All right, thank you very much for that um, amazing session. Um, there is a question um, and it's for Wadi. So let me quickly take that before I proceed to the next question. Um, Miriam says, uh, a question is, 
the nexus between gender equality and development. So she said, can we assume that the economic state of women dictates the tune of all other activities ranging from politics to social? Wadi, the question is for you. Yes. Um, thank you very much. I'll try to do justice to this. And I've been enjoying the conversations and also reading through the comments and <laughs> that story for another day. But um, for me, I would say that there's um, everything intertwines and there's an intersection. Of course, when we see how the world is, when we see countries that are very developed, I mean, we hear of developed, developing, underdeveloped, they're just different you know, categories. But you see that most countries that are termed developed, you see that, to be fair, there's no country in the world that has actually achieved gender equality, if we want to be honest. And many times when we are in Africa, you look at the other places like everything is perfect but um i don't want to say much but i would say that coming here and even schooling i'm seeing a lot of you know inequalities and injustices that happen in different ramifications and in different forms so i would say that no country has achieved that however there are many countries that are way ahead than others and you see that many countries that are actually developed and when we talk about you know social welfare we talk about access to education we talk about even um life expectancy you see that many of those countries they actually have women in power and not just occupying positions but in power because there are two different things you can occupy a position but you may not necessarily be in power so i would say there's a link because like my colleagues have said um i don't know there's this like thing where people um some of the words that are attributed to women are like emotional and all of that. Mean, meanwhile, it's actually a positive thing. I always say I'm very emotional. You know, I, I'm someone who I cry quite a lot, but then I make some serious decisions that I know that because of being emotional, I know that it's beyond me. You actually, being emotional helps you to actually see the bigger picture of things, see that whatever decision you make, you know, affects so many lives. So being emotional is not necessarily a bad thing. So before I used to be scared to own that, but now I own it, I'm emotional, but I still make, you know, decisions um, quite well. And then you see when a man is actually doing the same thing a woman does, they say he's, what do they call it, assertive. Meanwhile, if it's a woman, she's arrogant. So, you know, the word play changes when it's, you know, for a man or a woman. So back to that, I would say that there's a link between, you know, um, women, gender equality and development, because many of these countries, you know, you see that women um, make decisions, very serious decisions. And let, let, let's talk about Africa now. You see that there are many people, not just, men but even old men that are like barely have anything to lose i would say it this way many of them um they have barely 20 30 or max 40 years to live so whatever decision they make i mean it will not necessarily affect them directly and because of how much you know wealth that they've amassed for their families their families will not necessarily be affected we are the ones who will be affected big time african union has agenda 2063 that's like 40 40, how many years from now? And we don't even know what that agenda is, you know? In 43, 44 years from now, I'll be almost 70, you know? So it's this is like serious business, you know? The kind of people that we allow um, to rule us. So I would say there's a serious link between development and, you know, gender. And I would say it this way, even in terms of, you know, aid, whether foreign aid or even local NGOs, you see that, Many of these initiatives and projects that are about empowering women, educating girls, you see that men are the ones leading it. Look back home at Nigeria. I go for programs, I go to IDP camps, go for workshops, and who is the um, country director? A man for a girl project. Who is the project lead? A man for, like, and I think there's nobody that can say much about women's biology more than men. Men seem to know so much about our biological makeup and how we function more than ourselves. And so it's really, really intertwined. Let's look at it. Many countries that are developed, you see that women are very powerful, not just occupying positions. And it's not about tokenism or just ticking boxes, but they make serious, serious decisions. The countries that may not necessarily take gender equality seriously and maybe doing well, you see that you can attribute it to maybe some natural resources or maybe tourism or something else. But if it's about 
human resources and how, you know, the whole human capital theory, if it's about strictly the people that make decisions that will make the country move forward, you see that women are very much involved. So I don't need to say so much. I would say that women, I mean, I, I don't want to even be, all, oh, we deserve a seat at the table and all of that, because we've been saying that for so long. But look at history. History shows proof that, you know, when women thrive, humanity thrives, because we don't think just about ourselves. We think about everybody. And not to say that men are selfish. Well, maybe to an extent sometimes. But you see that a lot of them, because of that whole faux ego and pride, they make some decisions that actually cause serious trouble in the entire world. Something that I can just sit down and you know talk about in terms of diplomacy, but because I don't want to look weak as a man, and that will be attributed to social constructs where men have always been taught that they are meant to be bold and confident since they were young. So them taking a step back looks makes them look weak. So they will decide to just do many things that will actually cause so much trouble to the world simply because they don't want to look weak and because they should be men. So I would say that if we want to truly develop as a country, as a continent, and in the entire world, women need to occupy serious you know, positions and make decisions. Thank you. Thank you for that, Madi. Um, so my question, yes, Anna. Before we continue, can you just keep it like one minute long? Because we're running out of time already. So the last okay, okay. Just, okay, so this question is directed to um, Wakanda. Um, okay, straight to the point. How how do you think we can prevent gender reform policies from being mere promises or audio promises? How can we um, do this? Wakana. Sorry, come again. I said, how can we prevent gender reform policies from being audio promises? Uh, I think uh, what we can do, uh, first of all, is uh, to understand that woman is a person. Woman uh, can do what men can do. And also, uh, example in Burundi, there is uh, uh, those structure that uh, in uh, private property, in Burundi, for example, in Burundi, uh, men have uh, uh, this uh, confirmation or this uh, space to say that they have uh, or uh, how can I say they have uh, all situation in their hands. They can do what they want uh, for uh, for rent, and also uh, for me, for women. It's not the same. And unfortunately, uh, women in government, there is this situation. Uh, the, the, main, the first minister in Burundi said that there is no equality in gender in Burundi. And this is what women in Burundi must understand. There is no equality of gender and it will still that we will not change. Men are better, men can do more, and men are uh, on high level better than women. So uh, if we have this situation, and even those women, those uh, uh, our child women, maybe they will see this situation, and then they will still have this catch in Burundi. So I think, what we can do is to have more, uh, more even like this one, and to teach also men, and also uh, what I think in general rank of understanding of what uh, gender equality means. Uh, there is so far from the bottom up a great absence of under understanding of the meaning of gender equality on, on the African continent. In Burundi, uh, for example, I work in Think Tank, City Great Lakes. 
uh, which works on the right access to land for women. And during meeting with uh, parliament, politician members of government, bosses of government, official leaders and other elected actors, the leaders see in the emancipation of women as an insecurity for the country because uh, they are afraid that woman, if she accesses uh, the certain right, such as land right, for example, uh, the woman becomes a power in the men uh, gazes. Uh, but this is against the Burundian culture, which wants to men to control into that uh, uh, the woman remains the slavery of the men and in all areas of the life of the women. So this is not only supposed by certain absence of laws in Africa, it's, uh, I can say it's a great challenge for the progress of the African continent. Thank you. Sorry, I just realized I was muted. Yes, of course. Um, before I go to that, I would just love to touch upon the question that Wakana just answered um, very briefly. I think a very quick way forward to, to making sure that these are not empty promises and audio promises would be to make sure that whatever policy and legislation they do has checks and balances and has ways to hold them accountable if they don't respect such policies. So policy that want to not just increase women's numbers in terms of women being in parliament, but just women participation as well and enabling us to actually have a voice and not have a voice we already have a voice but amplify our voices would be um, counterbalanced by policies and legislations that make sure that we can hold the governments accountable if um, they don't you know go through with what they promised with that being said in terms of closing remarks thank you so much to our brilliant um, host and thank you so much to the brilliant um, panelists that that I was here with it was such an honor and such a pleasure and I love that it's, uh, it's an African woman's face. I, I needed that and my heart is, is very full and like very at peace right now. So thank you for that. Thank you, Vanessa. Sophia, just final words. Um, <laughs> uh, I do have a Nietzsche and Vanessa's sentiment. I do have to say that I was just stalking you. So if you do get a ping on your social media, that was me. <laughs> I do also want to quickly address something that I saw in the comments um, just about um, someone saying there's no law stopping women from being in political spaces. I, I want to say that, that that just feels like we're being blind to the problems, right? I mean, there's no law anybody can contest, right? But we, we know that that's not the reality. It's not that straightforward. It's not that simple. I simply cannot pick up a form right now to say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to run through. I couldn't even just go for a local government chairman. It's there's a whole hierarchy to things in this country. And it's not that straightforward, um, especially the comments of people saying women do not support women. That is another patriarchal propaganda that we need to constantly dispel, right? It is a false narrative. If anything, I have seen men go head to head. Have you guys seen when the guys in our parliament fight? They go face to face, hand to hand. And nobody, <laughs> nobody says men don't support men. But like saying that women do not support women is it's an absolutely false narrative. It is a narrative that is absolutely patriarchal and rooted in the culture of us always having to compete against one another. I know that we're running out of time, but picture this, right? I'm young and this is, I'm gonna just be very honest because I was born in a slum. And here's the thing, when you're born in a slum, there's only one short ticket out of Islam to get married. So there's all these young girls like me who we're all competing with ourselves to dress up nice so that the best guy in the neighborhood is the one who comes for us. This is not like our own doing, right? That's the upbringing that we have to compete with one another, to gain men's attention because that is like 
a sure ticket towards a good life and a comfortable life. So it is not, this is not a women don't support women situation because I am where I am today because of women. Women put me on, women recommended me, women did so many things for me, and they continue to do so every single day in society. So women supporting women is a sentence that I absolutely hate to see because that's propaganda and that's something that needs to go. And saying something like, oh yeah, there's no law stopping women from going into political space as well. The, the Senate literally just rejected the bill to allow more women in political spaces. So I don't know what you're talking about. Rounding up, um, thank you so much, Anna, for this invitation. It's like Vanessa said, I feel so full that I was able to share such a powerful panel with amazing African women who know the truth, who know the light, and who are simply working for every single person, not just women, but men as well. We're working for you too, so there's no need to say we're not supporting one another. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Wadi, real quick, just a few seconds. Yeah, so I don't have anything to say because <laughs> they've all said it all, but I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to share space with my sisters from different countries in Africa. And I hope that, you know, these conversations, you know, transcend just Zoom and then we're able to continue having it in real life. And I hope that the break, the bias would actually happen in real life and not just a, a tag online on March 8th, just one day in the entire year. So so thank you so much and i would say anna and the team next time it should be two hours because it seems like when women have space we have just so much to say but i'm really grateful and i've learned so much so thank you once again thank you well kind of just really brief do you have any final words oh uh, yes um uh, what i can uh i can add is uh, i think that the work of including women in uh, leadership, progress, daily monitoring and evaluation because women's rights will never be served only played. We really have to keep up the pressure of raising our voices against the various forms of discrimination while maintaining support for women on improving their techniques and skills Sorry, in the fighting uh, their rights. I think uh, as a as, uh, uh, our panelists say we can have as well they say after we want two hours or the whole day for this uh, conversation because one hour only is not enough and I think we have many things to say about this program and if possible we ask African Liberty uh, to give us uh, another opportunity in April or we never know, or May, we will be uh, okay and happy. Thank you and uh, thank you to the best panelists. Anna, you just were the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And thank you all for being here. We tried it all. When women are more a lot of good is done and the entire world will benefit from it. So that's all from us from now. Until next month, stay safe.